Good morning and welcome to Southern Maine Healthcare's Medically Speaking. I'm your host, Robert Erickson, and for the next 30 minutes, you'll hear about medical issues and topics of the day directly from leading medical professionals at Southern Maine Healthcare. Welcome to this week's episode of Medically Speaking. Our guest this week is Cynthia Chow. She's a general surgeon who does a lot of breast cancer surgery. Dr. Chow, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. So we usually like to begin the show by finding out a little bit about our guests and background. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in medicine and, and where you're from? So I was born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. My parents were doctors up there before it became a state. Um, so it's interesting, their medical degrees say Territory of Alaska. And then they um, had their kids up there, and I was raised there, and then um, came down to Stanford University for my undergrad and thought, I am not going to be a doctor. I can't have that lifestyle. So I tried lots of things. I tried computer science, and I tried teaching, and just I kept coming back to biology and coming back to wanting to, to be a doctor. So then I went to medical school um, at Columbia University in New York and went back to California for my residency at UC Davis in Sacramento. So why surgery? Why, why did you go into the field of surgery? So I loved working with kids, but, um, but all the political and, and, you know, careful stepping with the parents I wasn't that good at. So <laughs> then I uh, tried anesthesia since my mom and my sister are both anesthesiologists, and it just wasn't active enough. It was too much sitting. I had to be more active. So I kind of fell into surgery, and I loved it. And um, you, you, make a, you make a change, and you have a response um, immediately, and that's what I like. So how, how long have you been a surgeon? I've been a surgeon 23 years. So as far as general surgery, how, how, how have techniques changed over the years? Oh, that's a great question. It's, it's really different. And even the training, you know, I work with the residents at Maine Med, and training them to become a surgeon is so different from when I went through it. It's much more collegial. It's much more innovative. You know, back then, it's this is the way we do it, and you must do it this way. And now it's like, let's try this. Let's do that. And lapar- laparoscopy is completely changed um, the mindset of surgeons um, from, you know, you do a surgery and then they go in the hospital and they sit there and recover to you do a surgery and we want them home and functioning and back to work and, you know, back uh, working with their families um, as soon as possible. We're trying to make surgery uh, not take over their lives. We, we just want it to be a blip in the road and then they move on with their life. Now, for you as a surgeon, how, how do you, what are the greatest challenges you have in keeping up with the, all the newest techniques that are out there? So that's a great question. We actually have to, there's so much out there and so much research. We have to pick and choose which ones are we going to jump on the bandwagon at the beginning or wait and see for some of the others. And so you go a lot by um, talking to your colleagues around the country, and you really have to stay up on the literature and the research to, to know which ones are kind of just being thrown out there and which ones actually are, are proving to be worth uh, pursuing. Now, you said you work with residents at Maine Medical Center. What, what do you look for in a good surgeon? Ooh. So you have to really, and, and I believe this, in a resident, you really want someone who's willing to learn and willing to try things and um, willing to listen to you and willing to talk back and say, you know, I've tried that. It doesn't work for me. Um, so you have to have someone strong enough but flexible enough to work with you. And I feel that a surgeon really needs to be that way throughout their entire career. They need to stand firm on this really works for me. I know not many people do it that way, but I have great success doing it this way. And yet they need to be flexible enough to say, look at these new technologies and look what my partner does. I want to try that. And and carry that through that their entire career. I guess I forgot to ask you this earlier in the interview, but how did you make it from Alaska all the way to Maine? <laughs> so I was a, a breast surgeon for group health in Seattle for 15 years, and I was the only breast surgeon for 600,000 lives, and there were 23 other general surgeons, and they did the regular breast cancers, and I kind of did the, um, the specialized um, breast uh, issues. And um, so I got a lot of experience that way. Um, then my husband retired, and I decided to go into, um, you know, locums general surgery, so traveling around the country. But you don't get a lot of specialized breast work that way. And then um, Maine Med lost two of their breast surgeons um, at the same time with very little notice, so they put a word out to the locums community for a breast specialist, 
which most of those people, most locums are just general surgeons um, and don't have the breast specialty. So I thought, oh, that'll be a good fit. And it was for a long-term stint for a year or so and came out and just fell in love with Maine. It's just, it's beautiful. I love the people. I love the scenery and the activities, and so I started looking for a permanent job. And you're here now at Southern Maine Healthcare. Tell us a little bit about what you do here at Southern Maine. 80% of my practice is breast, and I do the, the benign breast, and I do the cancers, and then the other is made up of um, call cases, gallbladders, hernias, colon cancers, and um, whatever needs to be seen uh, that the other surgeons can't work in. Well, we're here to talk talk mainly about breast cancer surgery. Walk us through what you do with a patient who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. How do you step into the process? So people start with um, the navigator, who is fantastic. She's Helene, and she takes um, these patients from their biopsy all the way through their treatment. Um, and uh, she talks with them first, kind of gives them an overview of you're going to meet all these doctors. And this is kind of what each one will do so that they're not overwhelmed just with, you know, meeting three people all at once. And then she sets up the appointments and she shows up at the appointments with the patient. And I meet with them with her. And we try to make it so they also meet oncology because that's what everybody's um, big question is not just what surgery do I need, but there's a lot out there about the surgery. But also, am I going to need chemotherapy? That's what really makes people sick. Their hair falls out, and that's a that's a big deal. And so we meet them at the same time, uh, and it's just a great multidisciplinary visit because I can say, this is what we're going to do, and this is how uh, chemo uh, fits into it. And then they meet uh, the oncologist right afterwards, and so they have a they come out of that morning with a great sense of this is my plan this is my overall view now breast cancer is a is a big subject it's a complex cancer when a woman is diagnosed how do you talk with them about the care that they will receive at southern maine healthcare so one of the things that's very important to us here is learning about that patient Nothing is cookie cutter. So I always start out the um, the appointment and the interview with, tell me about yourself. You know, are you a mom? Are you retired? Do you have a job that you, you know, work 80 hours every week? Um, because that's very important for how we craft a plan, a treatment plan for that patient. And then we move into the specifics of her cancer. And then we move into the specifics of, you know, these are all the options. And then together with the oncologist and the navigator and the patient, we think of this is going to fit best with you. You don't have time for a long reconstruction or you won't have time, you know, your 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 health isn't robust enough for this, the harshest chemo that we have. We, we put a plan together that's very individualized for that patient. So in, in my limited exposure to breast cancer, family members from years ago that it seemed like the only treatment was a mastectomy. Uh, how has that changed over the years? So there have been lots of studies, and it took a lot to convince surgeons. You know, we thought the bigger the surgery, the better it is for the patient. We're going to save more lives. But the studies have really shown that lumpectomy and preserving the breast is just as effective in terms of survival for patients. Um, and so things have really kind of gone to less invasive, and you get to keep your breast. You don't have to lose your breast. Um, and then with the advent of lumpectomy, of course, um, we're using radiation more often. And so it really becomes a multidisciplinary effort to make sure that the radiation oncologists meet the patient and, and tell them it's really nothing as scary as chemo. Can you talk a little bit about how this has changed over the years? I mean, what what were they doing 100 years ago? What were they doing 25 years ago as opposed to what we're doing now? So I don't know the exact timeline, but I do know in the um, distant past, we would try to cut everything out. So we would cut not just the breast, but the skin and the muscle all the way down to the rib cage. And then um, we started leaving the skin behind, leaving the muscle behind, and found we were getting results just as good, and it didn't have to be as disfiguring. We also would take lots of lymph nodes, and, you know, 40, 50 percent of women would get that arm swelling, the lymphedema. And now with the, the newer studies, we're really discovering we don't need to be that invasive with the lymph nodes or with the, um, with the breast. And gradually, we're leaving the breast behind, um, and we're leaving more lymph nodes behind. Now we're doing what's called a sentinel node biopsy. That's been kind of standard in this country for over 10 years. And, you know, we just take a few lymph nodes as opposed to 
two-thirds of the lymph nodes, and the lymphedema, the arm swelling rate, is decreased from 40% down to probably 3 to 5%. It's a tremendous service to patients. So tell us a little bit about the sentinel node biopsy. How, how, what's, what's involved in that? It's very cool technology. It first started with melanomas, um, and you can inject some uh, isotope and some dye and then follow where that goes up to the node basin, and it just really highlights which nodes are the ones to take that are draining that cancer. So it's very specific, and it's very accurate. So you just take um, two nodes instead of 15 nodes um, just by using a handheld Geiger counter in the OR, putting it right on the tissues, and it's uh, just like TV. It goes click, 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 when it's on the over the correct node. And then you look, and the blue dye um, is in that same node, and it's, so you just take those nodes out. If the cancer is going to spread, it's going to be in those lymph nodes. And if those lymph nodes are clear you can leave the rest of them alone. Now, have you, have you had patients come in who, who have had breast cancer in the past, years ago, and maybe there's a recurrence now, and they come in and see these new techniques? How, how do they react? The big changes really were prior to 15 or 20 years ago. So the women that had the really disfiguring surgeries, they're, they're um, not having additional cancers at this point. But the women that had cancers 20 years ago, the, the, the main differences are with the lymph node surgery. But 20 years ago, we were already doing um, just modified mastectomies, not radical mastectomies. So if a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer here at Southern Maine Healthcare, what are, what are some of the treatment options available to her? So for lumpectomy, um, we offer seed localization, um, which is a new technique. Um, we're actually the first in Maine to um, offer magnetic seed localization. Um, many places in the country do radioactive seed localization. Prior to seed localization, we've always used um, wires, which involves coming in the morning of surgery, going to radiology, having a wire coming out of the breast, taped to the breast, waiting for your surgery, and then having that removed with the cancer. Um, Places around the country have moved to radioactive seed localization, um, which involves a very um, robust program of nuclear medicine um, and has some a lot of regulatory um, issues to go through because of the radioactivity. Um, and now we are using a magnetic seed localization technique, which simplifies a lot of things and um, still has the value of the seed localization. So the, the best part about seed localization is that it can be done before the day of surgery. So the patient doesn't have such a long day of surgery. They come in prior to the surgery up to, you know, a couple of weeks before the surgery and the seed is placed as a simple outpatient 30-minute procedure, um, which is uh, painless, and they go right back to work. And then um, the day of surgery, we remove that seed uh, in the operating room uh, with the cancer um, for the lumpectomy. And the radioactive seed is what most places have been using, and the new technology that we are using is magnetic. So we, it basically a, a, a little metal seed is placed into the breast, and in the operating room I use a little uh, wand, which we wave over the breast to localize that seed, and that tells me what part of the breast and the cancer to remove. So if a woman has multiple breast tumors, does that require more than one seed? Yes, um, it does, unless they're very, very close together. And that can be done, you know, so when there are when they're far enough apart, we can localize both um, areas. And that can be done with two wires, two radioactive seeds, or here we use two magnetic seeds. Is there a distinct difference between radioactive seed localization versus magnetic seed localization as far as outcomes? Is it just a, a newer procedure? That's a great question too. The radioactive, there is no difference. Um, the outcomes are exactly the same, but it is much simpler for the OR staff. It's um, for the regulatory, uh, the regulations um, for pathology. Um, it is, it streamlines everything. So to the listener hearing this broadcast, what, what sort of uh, danger is there? Is there anything that they need to be concerned about? Are there any issues you run into with this procedure that might be concerning? No, the same risks with the wire localization are present, you know, bleeding infection, the same risks with uh, radioactive seed localization, which is used around the country. Um, The magnetic seed is safer in that if we lose the seed, you know, after it's out of the body and it drops out of the specimen, um, if it's radioactive, it shuts down the OR because of the requirements to retrieve anything that's radioactive. 
and the magnetic seed, once it's out of the body and we know that everything is removed, it doesn't matter if it's lost. Um, it's just a little metal particle. Now, you've been doing surgery for two decades, and you're seeing these changes. Do you expect significant changes going forward, like on a yearly basis with treatments like this? In this case, Southern Maine Healthcare is the first hospital offering MagSeed localizations. Is that is that right? We are the first in Maine, yep. There are places in Massachusetts using it. I do see going forwards, they are working on magnetic sentinel node technology that's uh, being rolled out in bigger facilities, and then they um, will roll it out in the smaller facilities after that. So um, that's exciting, too. It's going to help, again, streamline things for the patients, make it much more um, convenient for patients, convenient for OR staff, um, simplify things. And one other question I have, usually we're talking about women getting breast cancer, but men can also get breast cancer. Are the procedures for treatment, are they similar? The procedures are exactly the same. They can have lumpectomy, though there's not as much breast to conserve, uh, and they can have mastectomy. Um, They can have a seed localization for a lumpectomy if they choose lumpectomy. You're listening to Medically Speaking. We're talking with Dr. Cynthia Chow. She's a general surgeon at SMHC who specializes in breast cancer surgery. And we'll be right back with more of our discussion right after this. For high-quality walk-in care, the best team is always on the ball. Look for Southern Maine Healthcare's Orange Walk-In Care Ball. With convenient locations open every day, it's your guarantee of quality walk-in care delivered by your hometown team. We are back with our guest, Dr. Cynthia Chow. Dr. Chow, are the treatments that are offered here, are they different than what you would see in Boston or New York or other places around the country? Nope. We do things exactly the same. The other thing we offer here is plastic surgery for the patients that um, need mastectomy. And we use plastic in hand um, associates from uh, Portland. And they do, I mean, they do all of the reconstructions um, at uh, Maine Med in Scarborough uh, and here. Um, they come twice a month, and so we're able to offer the same services uh, for immediate reconstruction as elsewhere. And they do implant-based surgery. Um, they go direct to implant if the patient is eligible for that, which is fantastic. You don't even have a staged procedure. You go to sleep with, uh, and you wake up already reconstructed. And we do nipple-sparing mastectomies, which is also a, a pretty new technique, but we're well-versed in, and we do that uh, very easily here. Now, women have many options available to them now that they never had before. And I was watching a show recently where they were talking about women who don't have any reconstruction after the mastectomy. Uh, What what are your thoughts on that? We have um, prostheses that uh, fit into the bra very easily. Insurance companies now pay for the bras. They pay for the prostheses. Um, and they're very straightforward, you know, for people that don't want the reconstruction and the extra um, uh, appointments with plastic surgery or the extra monitoring um, of their implant in 10 or 15 years, they um, can just have uh, their mastectomy and use a little prosthesis that fits into their bra. They put on the bra, they're, it's right in there, they take it off, and they're all set. Now, we, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but how, with all the advances that have happened, are surgeons these days, are they open, more open to new ideas? Uh, how have things changed over the last 25 years in terms of what surgeons are, the ideas that they're open to? I think we've always been um, cautiously forward-looking. <laughs> we want to make sure we're not harming the patients, but we're definitely on board with you know, new techniques that will uh, make life better for patients and um, provide a a good service for patients. It just took that step from mastectomy to lumpectomy just really took a lot of um, convincing. So lumpectomy has been great for patients. They get to keep their breast. And newer techniques now offer us um, the ability to make a lumpectomy look even better. So previously, we would just kind of cut the lump out. There would be a little bit of a divot or a big divot, but patients get to keep their breast. And most of the time, they were pretty happy with that. But now we're, we've got new techniques called oncoplastic surgery, where we can actually really um, focus on not just getting the cancer out, but once it's out, reshaping that breast so it looks like a breast, there's no divot, um, and it's much, e- even with that, it's, uh, it's 
even better for patients. And we do that here at Southern Maine. I do that. And if there's any question, um, like for a breast reduction um, with oncoplastics, we'll have plastics come in and help with that. Now, from a patient's point of view, uh, with all these changes, again, and the, mo- the modernization of all these processes, when they come in, do you have to educate them about the what's available, or do they come in with a certain set of expectations? Robert, that is a great question. Nowadays, in this country, the, uh, many women are coming in saying, I just want both breasts off. I'm tired of this. There's no reason. They've served their purpose in my life, and I'm just done with you know, annual mammograms and biopsies and all that nonsense. So they are coming in um, often with the expectation that they just want it over and done with and and have the reconstruction. Um, And so that's good and bad. It's good that they know that it's one of the options. But I do want all the patients that come in with that expectation to know what the other options are, which include lumpectomy with oncoplastic reconstruction and what the differences are and what really works for them. But it's a nationwide phenomenon that women are really just coming in saying, I want the bilateral mastectomy and reconstruction. And often they don't need the double. They can get by with just one. And often they don't even need the mastectomy. They would do just as well with lumpectomy. But the bottom line is once, for me here um, in at Southern Maine, once they have all that information, whatever they decide, if they still are eligible for a lumpectomy and still want the mastectomy, it's ultimately their choice. So if you have a patient like that who comes in and knows what they want, do you try to convince them about other options or do you just do what they want? Another great question. It is, that's where, you know, my opening um, discussion with them at the very beginning of the appointment comes into play. What's really important to them? What are their priorities? Are they really, you know, have they been getting biopsies and callbacks for the last, every single year for the last five mammograms? You know, then I can truly understand, yeah, they're really tired of this nonsense and mastectomy might be very appropriate. I do tell them that the academic centers around the country are focusing on women wanting mastectomies and academic centers are really pushing for women to have conservation and not mastectomies. And I let them know that and I let them know if they go for second opinions, this seems to be a big push. Um, And then I give them all the information and the fact that survival is equivalent and even recurrence rates are very, very similar between mastectomy and lumpectomy. The chances that it might come back again in five years or 10 years, very similar between lumpectomy and mastectomy. Um, And if they still choose to have a mastectomy or a double mastectomy, um, I make sure they have the information and we honor their wishes and we go with uh, what's going to work for them. Does it have a lot to do with age? No. Um, I find women in their 70s are just as fed up with having to do this every year as women in their 40s who are looking at another 30 to 50 years of this nonsense. Um, and they, uh, they seem to both um, have the same opinion when they come in. I really just want to be done with this. So what sort of trends are we seeing here at Southern Maine Healthcare in terms of ages and diagnoses? What, uh, what, what trends in York County are we seeing in terms of breast cancer? I think we're pretty equivalent to the rest of the state. One, one thing, so I am the cancer liaison person with the Cancer Committee for American College of Surgeons, anyway, the cancer program. And I've been looking at our statistics. We actually have quite a, we have more women between age 40 and 49 in this county with breast cancer than they do um, nationwide. It's, uh, it's about you know, 18% versus maybe 12% nationwide. So uh, we don't know what that's about. We don't know why that is, but we do see a lot of women in that age group with breast cancer. Now, we talked a little bit earlier about the patient navigators that are here at Southern Maine Healthcare. How do you think that enhances the care that people receive here at SMHC? Oh, it's amazing. Um, the navigators, and we're, we're using that model for colon cancers and melanomas and all kinds of cancers now. But it's such a fearful word, that cancer word. And then you, you, your mind just starts racing and there's so much information on the internet. You just don't know which applies to you. So the navigators are so helpful to, you know, kind of see where a patient's at, decide if they're looking at the internet, internet too much or not enough, you know, maybe they need a little more information so they're not quite as afraid. And they really help them um, get a good sense of 
um, what's what's coming down the pike and that you don't need to be afraid of it because we've got the people and the staff here to take you through it step by step. Now, Dr. Chow, what kind of changes have we seen in reconstructive surgery? Well, it used to be that we, everyone had to go through a two-stage uh, reconstruction for implants. They would have a tissue expander, which would stretch the skin up, and, uh, and then it would sit there at the new size, and then they would go through plastic surgery a second time to take that expander out and put an implant in. Now we're moving to direct to implant where uh, because we can save the skin envelope, it's the correct size, they can just go directly to the implant and, um, and the patient wakes up done. We also have um, new techniques for nipple sparing. Used to always believe that the nipple is at high risk for recurrence because the entire breast drains to the nipple. And now with certain criteria, you know, the cancer is a certain, certain size, certain distance from the nipple, we can do nipple sparing mastectomy. And that is just a, a, a wonderful reconstruction option for patients. Um, and when you combine that with the direct implant and saving their own nipple, patients have been very, very pleased. There's another option that is very wonderful here um, in Maine. Um, I actually wasn't doing it in Washington yet, um, but you have to have people on board from radiation oncology, um, and we have such a great multidisciplinary group here. That everybody talks beforehand, and it works very well. But we can now do um, reconstruction with radiation. We used to think that with implants, well, it used to be that with implants, um, you can't, you could not do radiation, or you couldn't put implants in um, skin that had been previously radiated. But now they've got great technology by using uh, certain constructs and certain extra things during the reconstruction process. We can offer implant reconstruction for p patients that are going to need radiation, and they still look great. And we can also offer reconstruction to patients that have already had re uh, radiation. For example, someone that had a lumpectomy and radiation 10 years ago, and they get another breast cancer in that breast. We used to say, nothing we can do. You just got to go with the prosthesis and have no reconstruction. But now we really can send them to the plastic surgeons and craft a, a, a plan that's going to work for reconstruction for them. There's been some controversy in recent years about implants. Do you, how, what do you say to patients to reassure them about uh, the, the implant process? 30 years ago, silicone implants um, and rupture of the silicone implants was thought to be related to the development of fibromyalgia, arthritis, rheumatoid problems, and there was a big lawsuit, and they were pulled off the market, and the, the implant company had to pay out to women who had um, silicone implants with rupture and developed those syndromes. That's all since been debunked, and I always wonder, so does the drug company get their money back? But... They didn't. The research now shows that the silicone implants are safe. They're back on the market, and it's pretty much what most women will go for now. Even if there's a rupture, we if it's not causing any um, redness of the skin or any pain in that area, we pretty much just leave them alone. Um, saline implants are still available, but when they rupture, they really deflate quickly, and so then you've got a deflated breast, and you have to hurry up and get back into plastic surgery to get another one. So the silicone is becoming more popular, and they are safe, and we are um, recommending that. Well, obviously, there are so many choices and options now here at Southern Maine Healthcare. How do, how do people find out more about this? That's a great question. The plastic surgeons um, are very, very skilled and savvy at being able to look at um, a patient and then talk with the patient, well, what, what size do they want to be? Ultimately, do, ultimately, do they want to be bigger? Do they want to be smaller? Um, are they, do they want more projection? And they know which implants will work for them. And they will say, I think these will work for you. But the, ulti the final decision, of course, is um, going to be uh, made in the operating room when you're asleep. But they have the 